Our first speaker is a clinical pharmacist of Baker Health System EICU in St. Petersburg, Florida, USA. A certified ICU liberation instructor by the Society of Critical Care Medicine and a board-certified critical care pharmacist by the Board of Pharmacy Specialties. She took her residency training in critical care pharmacy at the Lakeland Regional Medical Center in Florida. She also took her residency in pharmacy at the Spartanburg Medical Center in South Carolina. She earned her doctorate of pharmacy at the Presbyterian College School of Pharmacy in Clinton, South Carolina. She is currently working and involved in various projects such as sedation management in critically ill, targeted temperature management or TTM, as well as COVID-19 clinical review and guidelines, and many more. Aside from being involved in guidelines and process development in their institution, she is also engaged in various teachings, activities, providing continuing education in the institution, such as taking action for ICU liberation and ABCDEF care. And today, to discuss ICU liberation, ABCDEF, and PADIS guidelines, let us all welcome Dr. Rebecca E. Conley. My name is Rebecca Conley and I'm a critical care pharmacist. Thank you for joining me today for a short session on the huge topic of ICU liberation. This term has been coined by the Society of Critical Care Medicine and represents freeing patients from the potential harms encountered during a stay in the ICU. Often these harms are considered to be standard patient care activities that may not be realized are causing detrimental impacts in both short and long-term outcomes for patients. Things like pain, oversedation, delirium, altered sleep cycles, immobility, and isolation all impacts patients negatively. I will disclose that compensation has been provided for the development of content and the presentation. No funds are provided to endorse any medication or product from the compensating entity. This is a topic that I am excited to share with you all today, and I did choose myself. Since this is such a large topic to discuss, our objectives are going to be pretty simple and straightforward today. We're going to expand on the practice guidelines for the management of pain, agitation, delirium in adult ICU patients. We're going to identify essential elements of the ABCDEF bundle and develop pharmacy-based interventions related to ICU liberation, as well as apply the learned concepts to the management of a critically ill patient. Since 2012, the Society of Critical Care Medicine has been focused on treating symptoms of discomfort as part of everyday ICU patient care. The most recent guidelines produced in 2018, also called the PADIS guidelines, are pictured here in order. P stands for pain, A for agitation, D for delirium, I for immobility, and S for sleep disruption. The guidelines go to talk about each piece is how it should be assessed and treated in the ICU and what outcomes each piece is associated with. Although the PADIS guidelines have served us well, a push for better care in the ICU has recently been of great interest, promoting the development of the ABCDEF bundle. ICU liberation, which takes away symptom trigger management and focuses more on patient comprehensive care, is pictured here. We'll walk through it together. A is for assess, prevent, and manage pain. B is to complete both a SAT and SBT, which we'll talk about in further detail. C, make the right choice of analgesia and sedation. D, delirium. E, early mobility. And F, family engagement and empowerment. The ABCDEF bundle, which makes up the ICU liberation initiative in terms of patient care, has been extensively researched and consistently proves beneficial outcomes. SECM recently published this infographic, which speaks volumes about the success of the bundle when action is taken to execute change following this initiative. It's talking the talk and walking the walk. Notable outcomes include a 72% decrease in next day mechanical ventilation, a 68% decrease in hospital death within 7 days, 65% decrease in next day coma, a 63% reduction in use of physical restraints, as well as large decreases in ICU readmission, 
delirium, and the likelihood of patients to be discharged to long-term care facilities. These are huge findings and what a win. It is also important to highlight that not every piece of the bundle has to be implemented to see benefit. Proportionally, as more elements are applied, outcomes improve in the same capacity. The trusted PADIS guidelines are not laws, but instead incorporated into the ABCDEF bundle and still make up a large portion of patient management and comfort. As you can see on the screen, each piece of the PADIS guidelines corresponds to one of the letters. P is found in A, assess, prevent, and manage pain. Agitation falls into C, making the right choice of analgesia and sedation. D, because it's such a hot topic, keeps its own letter. Delirium is very important. I, or immobility, falls under early mobility, and S for sleep disruption can fall under a couple different pieces. There are two new letters added to the bundle that weren't addressed in the PADAS guidelines directly. B, for performing both the SAT and SBT, as well as F, engaging the family and empowering them to make decisions for their critical care family member. The ICU triad is the conundrum our critically ill patients face. It is all interrelated in more pathways than I can get into today. It really reminds me of the trauma triad of death with three key features, pain, delirium, and agitation that feed off each other to directly increase the risk of four outcomes in death. It's easy to gloss over these items in our daily workflow, forgetting the contributing factors, which could lead to lack of appropriate intervention. Spend a few moments reviewing the diagram and ask yourself, what you honestly consider during daily patient care activities. Acknowledging and working to change these contributing factors is part of the ICU Liberation Initiative. Let's dive into each piece of the bundle. First, element A, to assess, prevent, and manage pain. Pain for sedation means that a pain assessment and treatment are done prior to the use of sedation therapy. Often when patients are in pain or uncomfortable, they demonstrate signs of agitation or even ventilator dysynchrony. If pain is controlled, demonstrated by an appropriate and objective assessment, the next step then is to consider sedation therapy. Pain should be routinely assessed in ICU patients at least every four hours, or is needed when there is a change in clinical presentation. Assessment again should be subjective, be reproducible, and reevaluated for therapy effect after treatment. Vital should only serve as a cue that a patient may be in pain, prompting assessment. When pain is managed at the forefront of patient care prior to sedation therapy, the following improved outcomes have been noted. A reduction in overall use of analgesic therapy, shortened duration of mechanical ventilation, and an overall decrease in ICU length of stay. There are several different ways pain can be assessed in our ICU patients. We will walk through this diagram together to get a better grasp on how pain evaluation can occur in the ICU. First, you must determine if the patient can self-report their own pain as this is the gold standard and we should always listen to our patients first. If the patient can self-report their pain, then determine if it can be quantified. If so, use of the numeric rating scale is preferred over the yes-no evaluation. If the patient cannot self-report their pain, you must then determine if pain can be evaluated in the patient. Patients who are undergoing deep sedation demonstrated by a RAS negative 4 to negative 5 have a GCS of 3 to 8 or undergoing paralytic therapy with a neuromuscular blocking agent cannot be assessed for pain. In these patients, we must assume that pain is present and provide some type of therapy for compassionate patient care. If none of those criteria apply, pain can be assessed using either the nonverbal pain scale or the critical care pain observation tool. The nonverbal pain scale seen here can be used for subjective and reproducible pain assessment in patients who cannot self-report their pain, but in who pain can still be assessed. A score of three or greater demonstrates pain is present and warrants treatment. Spend a few moments reviewing the key elements of the scale. The critical care pain observation tool is currently the most validated pain assessment for critically ill patients. The assessment tool shares common features with the previously discussed nonverbal pain scale, but is more in line with how an agitated and uncomfortable patient may be characterized upon evaluation. The CPOT scale uses many keywords that describe agitated patients, such as pulling at lines, attempting to sit up, and ventilator dyssynchrony. Again, as many of these presentation features are actually all driven by pain. As with the nonverbal pain score, a score of three or more demonstrates pain to be present, warranting treatment. Treatment of pain in the ICU is a core responsibility we owe our patients. 
Without appropriate pain treatment, patients are at increased risk of developing chronic pain, physical impairments, and even post-traumatic stress disorder following an ICU admission. Non-pharmacological approaches to pain management are extremely important and should be tried prior to pharmacological therapy. Consider interventions such as mobility, repositioning, and relaxation. From a pharmacological standpoint, opioids do remain the mainstay of pain management. Other agents may be used in certain patients as adjunct pain control. It's always important to understand the patient's baseline presence of pain and understand during an ICU stay, there is additional pain added to that. These patients often require an increase in pain therapy from what doses or agents they are using at home. For the moment, I'm going to skip over element B and move on to C, the choice of analgesia and sedation therapy. I'm not going to deep dive into the pharmacological elements of different agents that make certain agents more fitting for certain situations, such as the avoidance of long-term use of fentanyl in obese patients due to lipophilicity and adipose storage, or the use of hydromorphone in patients with a history of opioid tolerance or abuse. Instead, this is a really good time to spend discussing adding on appropriate sedation therapy to existing pain management when controlling pain just isn't quite enough. After pain has been ruled out as the cause of patient agitation and anxiety, sedation can become part of the management strategy. Standardized agitation assessment has been associated with the following improved outcomes a shorter duration of mechanical ventilation, decreased ICU and hospital length of stay, decreased incidence of delirium, and a decrease in long-term cognitive dysfunction. The goal of assessment is actually to minimize all exposure to sedative medications, including opioids and benzos, as well as propofol, by utilizing the lowest possible dose to maintain a reproducible assessment at any given time. The Richmond Agitation and Sedation Scale, commonly known as RAS, is the most common assessment used for determining a level of sedation in critically ill patients. The scale ranges from a negative 5, representative of an unarousable patient, to a positive 5, representative of an uncontrolled and combative patient. For years, the term light sedation has been used as the goal for patient alertness in the ICU. The ICU Liberation Initiative challenges that standard to promote targeting a patient who is awake and as oriented as possible while providing maximized comfort and safety of the patient and staff. Patients can be awake and oriented during mechanical ventilation as long as they are alert and calm as well as comfortable, making a RAS score of 0 to negative 1 truly desirable. Keeping patients as alert and cooperative in their care as possible will help improve outcomes such as decreasing delirium and length of stay. It is important to note that RAS assessment first starts with observation alone for score 0 to positive 5 then moves to voice stimulation for assessment of awakening and eye contact for RAS scores of negative 3 to negative 1. If any patient contact is made through touch, the patient automatically falls into a RAS of negative 4 to negative 5 or the RAS assessment is invalid. For RAS values greater than negative 3, the patient should also be assessed for pain through either the nonverbal pain score or the critical care pain observation tool and delirium by use of the CAM ICU. As these scales are validated in patients, at levels of sedation of 0 to negative 3. There are many causes of distress in the ICU, with the three main factors being the ICU triad of anxiety, pain, and delirium. What we should consider is what we can do to reverse these exacerbating factors. For example, can we treat the underlying etiology such as withdrawal? Can we add back home medications the patient is dependent on? Can we remove uncomfortable and invasive lines, drains, or catheters? Has the patient had a bowel movement? And probably the most important thing is can we remove any medication that causes delirium, such as benzodiazepines? There are two main themes in ICU sedation. One, light sedation, and two, deep sedation. Light sedation should serve as the gold standard for patients in the ICU, again targeting a RAS of 0 to negative 1, representative of an awake, oriented patient who is able to cooperate in their own care. Maybe we should actually call this no to low sedation. Light sedation is associated with improved outcomes, such as decreased length of mechanical ventilation, decreased incidence of delirium, and decreased length of stay, to name a few. This is an appropriate score for patients both on and off the ventilator who are kept comfortable. Medications may be administered as bolus only when necessary or as continuous infusions. Deep sedation is an appropriate 
goal in certain patient populations, such as patients undergoing target temperature management, those with increased intracranial pressure, or patients in status epilepticus. If patients are to be paralyzed for any indication, a RAS of negative 4 to negative 5 should be achieved prior to paralyzing. This means the patient is not arousable by voice and may or may not respond to touch. Once the patient is paralyzed, pain assessment and RAS are no longer validated because these assessments cannot be completed. Patients to undergo paralytic therapy should first have pain control as indicated by a nonverbal pain score or CPOT of less than 3. Remember that pain assessment is only validated down to a RAS of negative 3. Once a RAS of negative 3 is achieved, further titrate medications to achieve a RAS of negative 4 to negative 5. This may require increasing both analgesia and sedation therapies that are ordered. A bispectral index monitor, abbreviated as BIS, may be used to evaluate the level of sedation in a patient prior to and or throughout paralytic therapy. If a BIS monitor is not used during paralysis, infusion rates of pain and sedation medication should not be decreased while the patient is paralyzed, since neither condition can be assessed. Train of 4 is not used to assess level of sedation, but to determine the amount of paralysis the patient is experiencing. Remember, for compassionate care of the paralyzed patient, we should always assume pain is present and provide treatment through continuous infusion. The treatment of anxiety and agitation in the ICU can be accomplished with a number of therapies. First, always consider non-pharmacological interventions that may make the patient feel more at ease. Then rule out causative factors and treat pain when present. If sedation is still necessary, there are a variety of agents that may be used. Propofol is a fast on-off agent that can be used for a variety of sedation levels. Presidex is used for light sedation only and cannot reach a RAS less than negative 2. So keep that in mind if deep sedation is required, this agent is not your drug of choice. Dexmedetomidine is also the only sedative agent that promotes REM sleep, which is super important for circadian rhythm and healing. Benzodiazepines have a place in therapy for patients who are perhaps in withdrawal or having seizures, but have been linked to prolonged requirement of mechanical ventilation, increased length of stay, and increased delirium. So it is best to avoid these agents whenever possible, especially in the elderly. Antipsychotics are great for breakthrough agitation treatment when used PRN, or can even be scheduled for patients requiring mood stabilization. Another agent gaining a lot of press right now is ketamine, which has both pain and sedation properties. Ketamine may also help increase blood pressure, which could be a huge advantage. Whatever choice is made for sedation therapy, it's important that agent is selected based on patient-specific factors and is only used after pain has been assessed and treated. Now let's discuss element D. Delirium affects up to 80% of mechanically ventilated patients and results in a threefold increase in mortality at six months post-discharge. With each day a patient is delirious, correlating to a 10% increase in mortality. Delirium is also directly related to ICU death, length of stay, and increased cost. Perhaps the most shocking and sad finding is that ICU delirium can cause post-ICU impairment that impacts patients for the rest of their lives. Delirium can be thought of as brain failure, just like any other organ failure we commonly see in the ICU. This brain failure consists of inattention and confusion. Delirium should be routinely evaluated in all ICU patients twice daily. Although inattention must be one of the key features present, delirium can pre present in a variety of ways. Delirium can present in three ways. As hyperactive, the patient who is uncontrolled and crying out or seeking attention. As hypoactive, the patient whose delirium may be overlooked because they are good patients who are withdrawn and easy to care for. And the third presentation, which is likely the most common, is a presentation of mixed delirium where the patient has episodes of hyper and hypoactive brain failure. There are several risk factors of delirium listed on the slide, with a couple worth highlighting since these risk factors may be modifiable. First, environmental factors play a huge role in decreasing the incidence of delirium. This includes minimizing things like isolation, use of physical restraints, and disruption of circadian rhythm. We can limit these things by increasing family presence, using pharmacological restraints and redirection or reorientation to alleviate need for restraints, and by turning lights and sounds on during the day while promoting rest and darkness at night. Open those windows, let the sun in, and consider blocked care. Also, literature supports use of patient glasses and hearing aids in the ICU, even while on mechanical ventilation, 
As these things are part of the patient's everyday life, we should be trying to recreate as much as possible while the patient is admitted. Another factor we can have impact on is what medications we are using. Medications such as benzodiazepines, steroids, antihistamines, opioids, and generalized oversedation all contribute to delirium. When the agents of practices cannot be avoided, it is still important to limit exposure by choosing the lowest possible dose for the shortest possible time. Additionally, patients in the ICU are at risk of withdrawal, whether from their home medications or illicit substances. It's important to incorporate accurate medication reconciliation practices and treatment and withdrawal into practice as soon as possible after patient admission. Unfortunately, there is no true treatment for delirium in the ICU. We can treat agitation due to delirium with antipsychotics, but prevention and detection are the true keys to therapy. CAM-ICU is the current assessment tool used to determine if patients are delirious. This assessment has been validated in both medical and surgical ICU patients, both on and off mechanical ventilation, who are not sedated to a RAS score of less than negative three, so it does exclude deep sedation. CAM-ICU has the highest inter reliability, sensitivity, and specificity when compared to other delirium assessment tools. Patients should be checked for presence of delirium at least twice daily. Spend a few moments reviewing the CAM-ICU. Now that we have discussed elements A, C, and D that are all heavily interrelated, we can come back to B, both SAT and SBT. The Wake Up and Breathe initiative promotes coordination of spontaneous awakening trials, known as SATs, with spontaneous breathing trials, known as SBTs. SATs and SBTs should be performed at minimum once per day, with literature truly moving towards twice daily. Completed SATs and SBTs simultaneously has been shown to decrease ICU length of stay, ICU mortality, duration of mechanical ventilation, and a decrease in medication and diagnostic test utilization. Even if your patient does not pass either the SAT or SBT portion, there are benefits alone in waking patients up daily, such as decreased depth of sedation overall, medication exposure, and rates of delirium. Certain patients may not be eligible for SAT or SBT. Safety screens are conducted prior to each trial to ensure the right patients are being selected. The ultimate goal of paired SAT and SBT is to wake up and breathe via extubation. Early mobility plays a huge role in the care of ICU patients, but is unfortunately often moved to the back burner as we fear patients are either too sick, too weak, or too sedated to receive the level of physical stimulation they deserve. Getting patients up and increasing mobilization has shown to improve the following outcomes. Increased ventilator-free days, decreased rates of delirium, decreased depth of sedation, and decreases in both ICU and hospital length of stay. If those outcomes weren't quite enough to spark your passion about early mobility, there are also long-term risk mobilizing patients helps to overcome, including impacting long-term improved quality of life, physical functional capacity, and improved muscle strength. We have all seen patients lose so much during an ICU stay. Let's help patients not lose the freedom mobility provides them with long term. The picture here demonstrates an awake, alert patient walking on the vent. This practice is not as far-fetched as one may believe and is currently occurring at hospitals in the area. It may take a group effort, but the win for patients makes early mobility truly worth it. I encourage you to talk with your team about barriers to early mobility and brainstorm ideas to overcome them. You're probably thinking F for finally, but this F stands for Family Engagement and Empowerment. When doing research on how the F bundle came to be, I came across many heart-wrenching stories from not only patients suffering from ICU-derived post-traumatic stress disorder, but also stories from families who suffered emotional trauma and mental turmoil while their loved one was admitted. Isolation in the ICU is very real and not natural for humans, who are naturally social creatures. Family engagement and empowerment strives to create a collaborative approach to the health care a patient will receive and the support a family will receive during the time. By helping to alleviate family concerns and fears, you are actually also helping improve patient outcomes. Family is very important for understanding who your patient was prior to this moment in their lives and knowing what their wishes may have been. Of course, there are always limitations to this, but let's think positively. Action items hospitals, critical care units, and us as individuals can take to promote family involvement are increasing visitation. While family is present, encourage them to help you reorient the patient and keep them calm. 
You can also schedule daily meetings with family or phone calls that allows for honest communication. This will help keep family in the loop with their loved one's progress and also reduce the number of calls being made to the unit by family members seeking information. Another great way to help both your patient and their support system is to help find ways loved ones can participate in patient care. In addition to the previously mentioned reorientation and calming effects family may provide, perhaps family can be involved in physical or occupational therapy. Help teach them about the care their loved one is receiving, such as medication education or having them observe wound dressing changes. The more the family is exposed to the care required and the critical nature of their relative, the more realistic they can be when it comes time to make those difficult decisions. Although many of the interventions and talking points discussed in this lecture are seemingly far from the pharmacy realm, it is very important that you are not only familiar with these concepts, but can also speak freely to them with your team. As pharmacists, we can use our drug knowledge, pathophysiology, and ethics training to help us recognize and treat patients in the ICU per the ICU Liberation Initiative. Now that we have gone through the guidelines and the ABCDF bundle, let's apply what you've learned to a patient case. Case 1. LA is an 81-year-old female admitted for respiratory insufficiency following a virus. At this time, she is on non-invasive ventilation, but is showing signs of intermittent agitation, and you are worried she will not keep her CPAP mask on. Which of the following is the most appropriate for LA at this time? A. Administer lorazepam 1 mg Q2 hours for anxiety. B. Assess the patient for pain and treat if necessary. C. Contact the MD to consider intubation. Or D. Contact the MD for restraint orders. In line with the ABCDF bundle and per the PAD guidelines of 2013 and the PADIS guidelines of 2018, the best approach to management of patients in the ICU are to assess other factors that may be contributing to the patient's agitated state, including the assessment and management of pain if present. Benzodiazepines like lorazepam are known to increase the incidence of delirium, especially in elderly patients and should be avoided whenever possible. We do not have enough information to know if the patient needs intubation at this time, but should always do our due diligence to prevent intubation of agitated patients by using environmental and pharmacological interventions first. Overall, the use of physical restraint should be limited due to the risk of further agitation and delirium. Patients on forms of non-invasive ventilation such as BiPAP and CPAP should never be restrained physically in case they need to pull the mask off in an emergent situation, so the answer is B. LA receives a CPOT score of 5 when assessed for pain. The nurse has administered a PRN dose of fentanyl 12.5 micrograms. She settles down and is now tolerating the mask. As part of the assessment, the nurse also determines LA is CAM, ICU positive. What risk factor or factors does LA have for developing delirium? Select all that apply. A. Advanced age. B. Female. C. Hypoxia. And D. Restraints. This patient has several risk factors that increase the risk of developing delirium in the ICU, some that are reversible and some that are not. Her advanced age and sex are two risk factors, as well as the current state of illness that is causing the hypoxia. The use of physical restraints is also a risk factor for delirium, but are not being used at this time in our patient case. Other important risk factors for delirium to consider would be immobilization, history of psychiatric disorders, and exposure to medications like steroids, antihistamines, and sedatives. Question 3. LA remains CAM ICU positive and is becoming more agitated with hyperactive delirium. Family has informed staff that the patient is prone to sundowning and has mild dementia. Reorientation and family support is not relieving her distress. What medication would be appropriate to reduce risk of patient and staff harm? A. Lorazepam 1 mg Q2 hours PRN. B. Fentanyl 12.5 micrograms Q2 hours PRN. C. Haloperidol 5 mg Q4 hours PRN or D. Melatonin 5 mg QHS. Use of antipsychotic medications like haloperidol are extremely useful in patients with acute agitation, especially when they are in danger of hurting themselves or others. C is the best answer choice. Again, in the elderly population and patients who have developed delirium, Use of benzodiazepines such as lorazepam should be avoided and can actually exacerbate the current condition or lead to a lengthened ICU stay. Information from a pain assessment is not available, therefore administration of a pain agent would not be appropriate. The use of melatonin in the ICU is certainly a controversial topic and we won't dive into that today. 
Although melatonin may not be able to help with the acute state of agitation, if we can use melatonin to help maintain a normal sleep-wake cycle, per circadian rhythm, and decrease delirium in turn, it may be a valuable tool to start a scheduled therapy for LA during her ICU admission. Question four. LA, who was previously CAM ICU positive, is now negative for delirium per your AM assessment. Which of the following is not an intervention that patients should receive to reduce incidence of delirium while admitted to the ICU? A, turn lights and TV on during daytime hours. B, ask the pharmacist to help you develop a block care strategy for uninterrupted sleep overnight. C, ask family to bring in the patient's glasses from home to have the patient wear. Or D, use restraints while the patient is mechanically ventilated. Since there is still no current treatment for delirium, efforts are really focused on preventing delirium in the ICU. Delirium is thought to be a state of brain failure in response to the patient being out of their normal state of functional capacity. Much of the prevention of delirium encompasses environmental control. Things like turning on the lights and sounds in the room on in the day and allowing for uninterrupted sleep at night and using the patient's home medications or glasses are all small things we can do that make huge differences. Also, involvement of family, mobilization therapy, and frequent reorientation are ways you can help patients become more comfortable with their surroundings and feel a little bit more normal. This particular question asks what intervention should not be performed to help reduce the risk of delirium. Therefore, the answer is D. Restraints should be a very limited patient care task and are not required for the majority of patients on mechanical ventilation. When patients are kept comfortable and have appropriate environmental and pharmacological interventions, the risk of self excavation is actually very minimal. Following ICU discharge, patients can develop post-traumatic stress disorder, with many being able to vividly recall being tied down for what they felt was going to be torture. For ethical treatment of people, not just patients, restraints should be limited. Thank you for your time today in discussing ICU liberation. 